seconded. And so we'll take the roll call and that will also serve as approval of the motion. Harlan. Aye. Hauser. I see you there. Mendes. Parker. Aye. Sepulveda. Aye. Sledge. Swara is high. Taylor. Aye. Tombs. Aye. Welch. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, the agenda that I sent out, um, I had intended to have a consent agenda with the first two items, uh, but because of the conversation that happened in budget, I wanted to make sure that this is explained in English. I thought I was speaking English at the time, but it was not clear enough. So uh, I'm not going to do a consent. We will take each item one by one, and I believe that I see Mr. Wilshire from MDHA on the call. So the first one that we would take is resolution RS 2021-733 uh, out by Suara and Tombs authorizes the Metro Mayor to submit the Nashville Davidson Cares Act substantial amendment to, to the 2019-2020 annual action plan <laughs> to the 2018-2023 to consolidated plan for housing and community development to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. And so uh, I see Mr. Alexander, uh, you recognize. Good, mo good evening, Mel Alexander. Um, the resolution before you allows MDHA to submit to HUD plans for about 5.9 million in CDBG CARES funding. Um, the amendment includes funding for homeless shelter operations and funding to acquire and rehab properties for permanent supportive housing. Um, your approval allows MDHA to move forward with submitting the attached amendment to HUD so that we can begin um, accessing these funds. Um, I will turn it over to you for questions. Thank you. Are uh, there any questions or any further discussion? Looking through, I don't see any. Uh, Mr. Alexander, oh, Ms. Uh, Councilman Marlin. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I know that um, that uh, Judith Tackett has talked about success that they have had in using hotel properties for some of this. Um, as as these funding seem to be about also acquiring properties, is that an option that's being considered? The option for using the funding for motels, is that what you're asking? That, that's my question is, I mean, I understand that there have been some uh, examples of, of using hotels for somewhat low cost housing that also provides a good opportunity for providing all the supports needed in one place as well. Is that is that a model that's being considered for this fund, this funding? No, the, the funding rule is specifically to acquire and rehab properties for new affordable housing. Um, focus on permanent supportive housing as opposed to the rapid rehousing funds, which I, I, I believe you may be referring to. That's currently how it's being used. I'm just wondering if there's a long-term version of that model that we would want to consider. So that, that may be another discussion, but thank you for answering the immediate question. And I believe that Ms. Tackett is on. We will be discussing the rapid housing as part of our agenda once we finish with the uh, bills that we have at hand. So we, she will be able to talk more about that in that session. Uh, is there any further discussion? All right, hearing none, time for roll call. Allen? Aye. Hauser? Mendes? Parker? Aye. Sepulveda? Aye. Sledge? Suara is high. Taylor? Aye. Tombs? Aye. Welch? Aye. We recommend approval, uh, seven in favor, zero against. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is resolution IRS 2021-741. 
approves a subrecipient grants agreement between the MDHA and the Metro Department of Social Services for one-time payments of first month's rent and security slash utility deposits on behalf of homeless persons obtaining housing through various campaigns. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Thank you. Properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Going through, I don't see any. All right. Um, time for the vote. Alan? Aye. Hauser? Aye. Mendes? Parker? Aye. Sepulveda? Aye. Sledge? Suara is aye. Taylor? Coombs? Aye. Welch? Aye. Thank you. We recommend approval 840 against. And the last uh, agenda item before we go to our uh, discussion is a late resolution. Suara, it's a resolution approving mayoral condition approval and acceptance of a local government emergency rental assistance grant from the U.S. Department of the Treasury to the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, acting by and through the Metropolitan Action Commission to be used for emergency rental assistance in accord with the purposes set forth in Section 501 of Division N of the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2021, published in the publication 116260. Um, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. I'm trying to see if Director Chrome is here. Uh, but this is, uh, uh, I'm very excited about this grant. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend a, a webinar, actually. Councilman Balin sent that to, to us, shared it a while back, and I attended, and they were talking about this money. Metro will be getting about $20.8 million, and it goes towards mortgage and rental assistance, and you all know that we need that a whole lot. Uh, it also focuses on um, helping people we can do for the last 12 months on late rents, and we can do three months on future rents. Um, based on the conversation from budget, uh, one of the things that the webinar stressed is making sure that it's not a first come, first serve basis, that we make sure it goes to the most needy. Uh, and the agency is ready to set aside a percentage of the money to be able to do that so that at least we're not giving that part out except to the people that meets the definition. Uh, so that is it. I don't see anyone from. Um, uh, Metro Action Commission, but I happen to also serve on that board, uh, and this was discussed out at our last board meeting, so I should be able to answer any question that you may have. Uh, and so with that, I ask for your approval. Is there any question or further discussion? Uh, Council Member Hurt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, just weigh in uh, and concur with everything that you said in regards to um, the funds that are being set aside for people who are most needy. Many of those individuals we serve every day in my day job, and we have referred many of them over to Metro Action Commission for some assistance. They are on fixed incomes. And, and, and we found also that with those who were affected by the tornado, it was about 80% of those were renters. And considering, considering that they rented, then they had definitely problems with trying to find more housing and able to stay and sustain themselves. So this is a life-saving um, saving grace for them to be able to access funds uh, from Metro Action. And they have been just tremendous in reaching out to the community and making sure that those funds are being put in the hands of those who need it the most. So I would encourage uh, your committee to vote in favor of this because it is uh, very much needed and appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Any further discussion? All right, saying none, we're going to the vote. Allen? Aye. Hauser? 
Yes. M Mendes. Parker. Aye. Sepulveda. Aye. Sledge. Suara is high. Taylor. Aye. Toombs. Aye. Welch. Aye. Thank you. We voted uh, to recommend eight in favor, zero against. Thank you. That concludes the uh, bills that we have on our agenda item. Uh, the next thing is that I, I have Ms. Tackett here, and um, I believe that we also have members of the... Director Cooper, do I need to adjourn affordable housing or is still part of our meeting? Because I know that we have uh, health and hospital folks here to go into that conversation, or we should just continue? No, since it's just a discussion, you can just go right into it. All right, thank you. And so, um, Ms. Tackett, if you would um, take over or anyone else, I think uh, Mr. Jamison is also here, so I'll yield to you all to get us started. Uh, Council member, Council member Van Reese has her hand. Uh, yeah. Oh, I cannot see. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Council Member Van Reese. I had to scroll all the way down. Yes, ma'am, you're recognized. That's okay. I'm in the V's down at the bottom. <laughs> uh, I just want to. I just wanted to report uh, to this committee. We did have uh, a victorious uh, groundbreaking or rock tossing, we should call it, uh, over at the 808 at Skyline Ridge, uh, bringing 178 affordable apartment homes online uh, within um, uh, a stone's throw, if you will, the Music City Solar and uh, Skyline Hospital on the new Skyline Ridge uh, Drive. Uh, and uh, it's a great example of how uh, pilot and 4% and public-private um, work comes together. It's a $50 million a project. And uh, I'm really, really excited about it. So I wanted to bring good tidings from the 808 at Skyline Ridge. We've got another one uh, underway. And uh, I want to thank uh, this committee for their ongoing support of a number of different tools in the toolbox uh, to let people know um, ways that they can bring affordable housing uh, online in our community. I also wanted to take this opportunity as a publicly notified event uh, to let you all know that I'm working on uh, future legislation um, along with uh, our good friend Kim Hawkins and with Lucy uh, over at planning to come up with some ideas um, to make more easily the opportunity that if this, then that on parking spaces for affordable housing. Oh. Uh, I've seen a number of different opportunities to reduce parking um, uh, and it's been approved in a number of different circumstances. And so uh, much in the same way that we've done uh, urban uh, zoning overlays uh, to reduce need for parking, uh, having affordable housing within walkable communities available to transit uh, to reward developers uh, in a way uh, by reducing parking limits. So it's in the early stages of getting that done, but um, if we can make that uh, something happen, then I'm gonna wanna make sure I get this committee's uh, feedback on it as another tool in the toolbox. So um, with that, thank you for the opportunity just to address the committee on both those matters and I'll, I'll listen in on the rest of the meeting. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, and thanks for the good work. Uh, we cannot do enough for affordable housing, and uh, we're grateful to the mayor, too, for the new affordable housing task force, uh, which Councilmember Allen and I are serving on. And so we'll continue to look into those uh, tools uh, to find ways for us to continue moving ahead. And so at this point, um, Ms. Tackett, are you ready for us? And if I might say, uh, I want to let you all know that the internet in my house is sporadic. And so when she starts to speak, I'm going to go off video to be able to conserve it so that I can So just not to be rude since I'm cheering. I thought it's worth the explanation of why I'm going off camera, okay? And so, Ms. Tackett. Well, thank you so much for having me. If I could have the ability to share a few slides, that would be very helpful. But um, uh, as I'm waiting for getting uh, that... Um, little ball there. I wonder, I wanted to thank you for allowing us to uh, provide you with another update. Um, <clears throat> so we already presented on November 13 about the situation of homelessness and the CARES Act dollars that are designated to address homelessness in Nashville. 
So, and, and you may recall that COVID has increased the visibility of homelessness. So we see a um, increase in outdoor homelessness and a decrease in shelter usage. So we have to really be aware of that. And that's kind of where I left you at the last um, meeting. Also, uh, for anyone who did not listen on the November presentation, uh, our regular emergency solution grant allocation for 2020 in Nashville was $450,000. And in response to COVID-19, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development allocated an additional $10 million to Nashville. Those grants are uh, administered by the Metropolitan Housing and Development Agency. I wanted to check uh, with Slade if you could give me, please, the um, presentation so you can pull along. It will be um, helpful so I can pull that up. Well, I'm gonna keep going then. Um, so basically a grant process was implemented uh, through for these $10 million in- Ms. Um, Tackett, are you not able to pull it up? No, I am not able to share. Uh, I okay, Slade, are you able to that. help us with that? Let's see if IT can, can uh, help facilitate that. Yes. I see that uh, Slade okay, is Okay, I am here. not a presenter. I should be okay. able to share. Be All right. Me first. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. So I went through this already as a, a quick recap. And um, so basically one of the things I wanted to I'm trying to find my place here. Okay. Um, just to recap real quickly of what we had in November is uh, we have um, received through COVID and the CARES Act um, $10 million in emergency solution grants, which is way larger than we've ever received in Nashville. So a grant process was implemented. And by October, a little over a dozen, about 13 actually local nonprofit organizations were allocated grants to build programs to address homelessness uh, during COVID. So Nashville also has received technical assistance from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I would like to introduce to you Heather Dillisher from ICF, she is the consultant assigned to us by HUD, and she will help me with this presentation. I would also like to thank Emil Alexander from NDHA, who is on this call and will help answer questions after the presentation. So today's update, I will focus uh, on the implementation of the current housing search. And one of the things you hear me repeat over and over is housing and homelessness. We know how to end homelessness. When I say we, it's pretty much all of us on the call. So, um, and um, I, I just wanna always bring back that homelessness is a housing status. Um, some people will need more services than others to overcome their current barriers to housing, but without housing, homelessness cannot end. And that's the guiding principle that's the common threat throughout all our community's efforts. And that's what we just need to remember at all times. Okay, and now I'm stuck with this presentation. There we go. Rapid rehousing links people quickly to permanent housing, and each person is signing a regular one-year lease. So basically they have their own lease agreement. The provider agencies advocate for low barriers and offer individualized services to their clients based on each person's need. In addition, provider agencies help with rent assistance for up to one year under this program. During that time, agencies link people with ongoing services like healthcare, transportation, income, mental health care, nutrition services, and so on. The goal is to have a sustainable housing plan in place that a person maintains after that one year support through revenue housing. 
And the emergency solution grants allow to provide rent assistance up to um, the fair market rent, which is set by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development for each area. And just for this year, in Nashville, the fair market rent uh, for an efficiency unit is up to um, $998 per month. That's how much um, a rent can cost. So we have implemented the current, current housing search um, in Nashville, and how have we done that? So over summer, and with the help of our federal consultants led by Heather, we met with community providers to determine how we prioritize the $10 million. The partner agencies, nonprofits in our community determined that the majority of funds, about $6.3 million, should go to assist people with permanent housing with support services. So that's that refugee re housing program we are talking about. Every week we hold a provider check-in and, and also training as needed that is led by Heather and her coworker, Melissa Michael. And when we talk about engagement, engaging people uh, experiencing homelessness, then um, it, it, happen, it happens through street outreach partners and also case managers in emergency shelter, shelters. They are asking people if they're interested in participating in housing and working on housing plans with them. Um, they agree, then people agree to a community-wide assessment that helps us move away from that first, first come, first serve approach uh, to an approach that links people with the right level of assistance and that, that is based on their individual situation. Our community adjusted our assessment tool um, to help identify people who are especially vulnerable to COVID complications based on their age, underlying health conditions, and also the length of time they have experienced homelessness. Again, these funds, the 10 million, were a response to COVID to some of the most vulnerable people in our community, and, and they are homeless. So the government has recognized that there is a need um, to set funds aside and get people into housing as quickly as possible as part of that process. Provider agencies also help people with the housing search. Um, they ensure that people know what housing is available. They ensure that people understand their lease agreement. They help with the actual move-in and all the essentials around such a move-in. And once people are in housing, the partner agency provides ongoing case management, links people to community services, income, and works with, uh, with a person to ensure they are able to remain stably housed even after the rent assistance ends. We are also coordinating with providers on the landlord search effort. I would like to really emphasize that each person who enters permanent housing through the current housing search effort through this emergency solution grant uh, CARES dollars, they are signing their own one-year lease. All partners look everywhere in Davidson County for landlord opportunities. We're, we're trying not to leave any um, stones unturned and really look at, in all locations and all ideas and follow up. And we are co coordinating in regular calls with each other about the landlord search efforts to avoid that we all call the same landlords. And now I would like to pitch the presentation over to Heather Dillashaw and really look at the results of our local housing search effort. Thank you, Judy. Um, and thank you all uh, for listening to us tonight. Um, I get the fun part where I get to brag about how well everybody is doing and all the amazing progress that has happened just in the short amount of time that the CARES Act funds um, have been been out um, and on the ground through MDHA um, just since October 1st, um, which is when we started implementing the housing surge with the emergency solutions grants funds for the CARES Act. Um, we've housed 220, y'all have housed 226 people through this funding stream alone. Um, in, in comparison um, to maybe 20 at this, you know, 20 a month um, on your regular housing pipeline. Um, so this is a really big difference. Like Judy said earlier, the the $450,000 a year compared to 10 million makes an enormous difference in how um, quickly and how effectively you can house folks. So um, 
that's the number um, since October with just that particular funding stream. You want to go to the next slide, Judy? <clears throat> we also wanted to talk about how many people have been housed since October across the board. Um, so you have multiple funding streams that already existed um, within your community. You had regular emergency solutions grant dollars, that $450,000 continuum of care funds um, that are around currently around five and a half million, five million um, that go to a variety of things, including including um, other projects that are not permanent housing, but um, those funds, um, as well as SS SSVF housing programs, that's a veteran funding stream, supported services for veterans and families. Um, so all of these and SSVF, um, the supportive services for veterans families, they also got additional CARES Act funding um, just through that funding stream. So they have additional funds as well, <clears throat> specifically for veterans that qualify. So through just regular funding streams that, that exist in the SSVF, you've, you've housed 142 people um, households. So overall, you're over 350 people since October um, who were literally homeless who are now no longer homeless. That's an extraordinary number. We don't often see even large, huge metropolitan areas achieve what y'all have. Um, so the providers have been working very hard. Uh, staff have been working very hard to coordinate this and organize this. So this is an extraordinary um, push um, to really use these dollars well. And it's taken a very strong collaborative effort among all the providers um, across all of these funding streams um, to provide these opportunities for folks um, and move them into a variety of different places um, in Metro. Davidson County. Um, go ahead, Judy. One of the one of the questions um, that we've gotten from the beginning, um, which is a very fair and very appropriate question, is what are the what happens next, right? Like what happens after the one year goes? Um, and so we've been working on that from the beginning. Uh, and when we talked to you in November, we didn't have as much um, information about what those specifics would be, but we do now. Um, so working with MDHA. Um, we have done a great deal of work on securing additional long-term subsidy um, in the form of mainstream vouchers, um, which is a kind of housing choice voucher. Uh, so we got an additional 100 of those. It's a one-time allotment, but it's a it's an additional 100 mainstream vouchers that are dedicated um, to this to folks who are who are homeless. Uh, this, it was one of the options that we did not have uh, on the table that we do now. There's a in addition to that, not beside that, but in addition to that, there are 18 of the of ongoing set aside vouchers for for folks as well. So that 100 will be a one time, but then we will continually have these 18 that we will continue to work into the stream as well for long term options for folks who may need that and are not able to be stably housed without additional subsidy once their rapid rehousing assistance ends. On top of that, there are shelter plus care vouchers. Um, we've been working hard on a different referral process for those. That's a continuum of care funding stream, but that is also an ongoing subsidy that you have that renews every year. Um, so there are additional vouchers there. I think we, when we talked with MDHA last week, 20, 20 or 25 of those um, are available right now that are getting put into the pipeline. Um, so those are a different funding stream than a, than a voucher, but they act similarly in a, into our long-term renewing subsidy for and that follows the tenant for as long as they need it, just like the vouchers. The veterans vouchers, um, similar to the mainstream vouchers, are dedicated to, to homeless veterans. Um, and then the soon-to-be built um, downtown permanent supportive housing effort um, that will be 81 units. Um, so there are multiple directions that we're working on for the sustainability efforts. Um, additionally, and I heard you at the end of um, your, your meeting um, talking to, to Mr. Alexander about the RFP that's going out for the acquisition and rehab for permanent supportive housing units. That's that's not on this slide, but that's an, that will be an additional number of, depending on how many units we can have a developer thinks they can do um, through that process, that will be another However, another ongoing longer term subsidy um, and units that are stable in, in your community as well. So we feel really good about the sustainability piece here as well. That you know, folks that are, are moving in with the funds that we have available now, many of them will move on without needing any of these things. We see that all the time, even folks that maybe you wouldn't think would move on without additional help do. Um, so that's very hard to predict. Um, we do have some predictors, particularly on folks that have uh, multiple barriers to housing or have 
um, life circumstances where they are not able to have a have a situation where they can pay fair market rent at in their household um, that will need longer term subsidy. And as you all know, the Nashville rental market is high, and so that is challenging for folks that don't that haven't become homeless. So folks. Um, like you were talking about the rental assistance program, it, it's hard across the board, right? For folks, um, you know, we, we live in the South, minimum wage is very low. Um, it is very hard um, in our urban areas um, for a lot of households to achieve fair market rent. So that is the reason that we were looking, that we looked at so many, in so many different directions for sustainability, uh, because we knew we were gonna need it um, for a number of reasons and beyond this housing surge too, right? So we'll. We'll get 400 plus households in through these CARES Act dollars and move those who need it um, onto additional long-term subsidy. And we'll continue to work on those sustainability efforts um, with the longer-term subsidy with MDHA and, and other partners. The continuum of care funds are also funds that can be added to over year after year um, with different projects. And Nashville has done that successfully over the last three years. That, that amount has raised by a couple of million dollars over the last couple of years. Um, so those are ongoing um, possibilities as well. So that you have these outside uh, funding streams coming in to support the other efforts that are also necessary, like this, like supportive services and connecting, connecting folks to employment opportunities, connecting folks to other um, medical care, et cetera, that may be necessary for housing stability for, for a particular household. So I'll stop there, Judy, I think with the sustainability piece and we can answer more specific questions at the end. Okay, I'm picking it back up. One of the pieces we have to, and we are paying close attention to is a racial equity. So we know that there's a huge disparity in homelessness when it comes to racial equity. Um, as an example, last point, last year's point in time count showed that about 45% of Nashvillians who stayed in emergency shelters or stayed outdoors identified as black or African American. And back then, uh, based on the census, that compared to 28% of the general population who identified as uh, Black or African American. So there's a huge disparity. And we see that across the nation, but we have to focus on this in, in Nashville um, very closely. So um, also want to, we are participating. So basically, what are we doing about it? So this slide is really showing that what how we really following the data right now through this housing search uh, program and uh, following what's happening. And then what are we, we also participate in a, another federal um, technical assistance opportunity in an equity demonstration project. Um, and, and they're really discussing with partner agencies and, and within our community what can we do to address this issue to improve um, access to housing for Black or African Americans that that we are serving, so that there is some that that we're really addressing this and and really not ignoring what's happening and do something about it. So I just really it's it's important that we we look at that and I didn't want to um, forget to talk about it because that's at the forefront of when we look at data. Yeah, we're also looking at who is it that accesses housing and uh, making sure that there's some equity conversation with that as well. Um, it's always good to take a pause and I wanted to do that real quickly and just really thinking it takes a community to build a community. And I'm not just talking, so in this presentation I talked a lot about the nonprofit partnerships, but it really takes all of us to build a community with all our neighbors in every neighborhood involved. So I really appreciate, I know that many people and many council members on this call understand this. I just really wanna always we need to take that pause and really think about what that means. And then the last two slides are really listing the uh, partners. I've talked a lot about the, the partnerships that we have. This first group is are the providers that um, have received grants to do rapid rehousing through these uh, $10 million. And I have to be clear, they're not just doing rapid rehousing, they're also doing some of the other programs that the second group is involved in. So there are prevention uh, uh, funds, street outreach funds, um, and essential service funds. There's a little bit, um, I think there's a tiny bit of emergency shelter, but not many, not much because the community really, really wanted to focus on the solution of homelessness with, with the housing piece and implement 
what is doable and available there. And with that, we really want to get to the Q&A. Um, um, Heather, Mel, and I are available for you. If there are follow-up questions, always feel free to email me uh, with that. I'm going to stop sharing the screen, and then we can go into the Q&A. Uh, Councilman, uh, thank you, um, uh, Ms. Delosho and uh, Ms. Tackett for the presentation. Appreciate that. And so, Councilmember Hauser, I see your hand up. Yes, I have a question that you may or may not have an answer to, but I have heard that if individuals have payments such as SSI or Social Security, et cetera, they need an actual address to be able to receive those payments. Do we at Metro have any kind of universal address or some sort of even post office box system for people who may not have a permanent housing address so they could access uh, their checks? Because it seems that this would have an impact on homelessness if they could receive payments that they're due and then perhaps be able to pay for rental. Yes, there are several organizations that offer such an address and mail services. Room and Inn is uh, one that comes to mind. I believe uh, Community Care Fellowship, National Rescue Mission. And then um, there are uh, uh, outreach workers that really um, uh, work with people and check in with them regularly and help receive um, IDs and birth certificates. Um, it's that ongoing outreach that's happening and, and so that's how it's handled usually. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hauser. Councilmember Hauser, you have your hand up. Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Allen. Um, thank you real quickly because I have a community meeting in four minutes, but I want to follow up on the question that I asked earlier about um, the use of hotels. I know Judith had mentioned in an earlier one that that had been part of the, the rapid rehousing solution. And my question is, with so many fancy new hotels coming online, is it possible that some of our older hotels um, may be having ultimately even when we recover a hard time filling rooms and might be interested in switching to serving as um uh in a long-term housing solution where there could be um supportive services concentrated in one area i mean i know that also kind of concentrates poverty which may not be good but but does that seem like something that would be worth exploring i, I can take that judy if you want me to Go ahead. Yeah. So th that is that's a great question. Um, that is um, that is something that is done in a, in a lot of places um, for all the reasons that you mentioned. As as newer properties come online, uh, with um, you know B and C class hotels that kind of get dropped further down the economic chain, um, and we do often see property owners put those on the market, and they are often acquired. Um, and turned into, you know, SRO, single room occupancy, you know, single resident occupancy, the old SRO model um, that we really do need more of. Um, you know, the, the vast majority of your homeless population, like most urban areas, are single adults, um, something like 86% or 84%, I can't remember exactly, but, it, you know, that's that's the majority of your population that experiences homeless, homelessness. Um, one of the things that's also an eligible expense for the RFP that Mr. Alexander was talking about, that a developer could choose to buy an existing, I mean, it does have to be an existing property, um, and often in those kinds of projects, it, it is that, or it is an older um, quadplex, or, you know, those kinds of properties that have been in dis disrepair and are not, um, not as appealing, you know, to a different kind of an investor. Um, so that's definitely a possibility, and it's, it's been done multiple places um, and is, and I think will continue to be as, as new properties come online. It's, it is often an underutilized option, um, but it, it's definitely one that we see used. Great, that's encouraging. I think we should try to figure out how to make it work here. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sepulveda. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, uh, Judy and, and Heather, for for coming and uh, being willing to to uh, explain this program to us. I, I know that you guys do a lot of work to try 
uh, and uh, house homeless people. So um, I, I really do appreciate that. I um, I know that some of uh, my constituents had some questions. And I was hoping that y'all could uh, help clarify some of those. Uh, I know that we have federal privacy uh, laws that we have to adhere by since these are grants and uh, the recipients have a right to, to, to privacy. Um, I think some of the narratives that we've heard is that there's no real plan. And it sounds like we were doing this before we received this 10 million. So I was hoping that you all could speak a little bit to that. Um, there was also a question of whether when we applied for these grants, uh, we applied to house families and not individuals. Uh, so that's my second question. And then uh, they had concerns about resources and you all spoke about some of those already uh, where you have case managers, you guys provide uh, uh, health support and mental health support. Um, so I was hoping you could just touch on those a little bit. I'll take the data piece first, because I think that that's an easy, that's a more straightforward one to answer. Um, we, we're we serving families as well. Um, there are, there are uh, agencies that only serve families that have these funds and we didn't break down these data slides that way, uh, but we can and do break it down that way. So we can, we can share that information as well that shows the number of um, households that are single, the number of house, you know, so, so we do break the data down that way um, and, and can share that information. So it's, it isn't, it isn't limited to, to any particular population. Um, it's more, it's about vulnerability and, and who is more vulnerable based on, based on assessments and so families end up on that priority list um, as well as singles. Um, so that's, so that's the answer to that. Um, the services that are, when, when Judy talks about supportive services and that list of things that, that she was talking about, um, a number of different kinds of supportive services are offered um, in these program models, and certainly that's true at Nashville. Um, the way that case managers work with folks um, is they do what's called person-centered planning in the social work world. Um, and so each, each household, individual or family, uh, regardless of household makeup, um, has makes goals with their case manager um, and makes choices about what they would like to choose or what they would like to have access to that, that would lead to housing stability for them. Um, so that's a collaborative effort with the case manager about what that looks like. And that could be in you know, a wide variety of things. And there, um, Nashville is a super strong community with all kinds of supportive services, right? Um, and so there are a number of different community partners that end up being engaged in those conversations. Uh, thank you. If you will provide that uh, breakdown, either if you can email that, uh, we'll appreciate that. Um, the, demogra the demographics? Yes, please. Sure, we can do that. Thank you. Um, and I think, Mel, is, uh, I, I see your hand up. Are you going to answer the third question by Council Member Sepulveda? Sure, I want to respond to the question about whether or not we've used ESG funding in the past for hotel and motel stays. Um, not to this extent, but it is allowed under emergency circumstances. And obviously some of those circumstances have been eased um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and one thing to emphasize, Judy mentioned that this is a much larger allocation than we've gotten in the past, but it's an allocation specifically um, to respond to the spread of COVID-19 in our community. Um, and this housing surge in partnership with local hotels and motels allows people to both exit homelessness but remain safe during the pandemic, which is sort of the reason why um, some of those restrictions are lifted because of COVID-19. Um, Thank you. Council Member Sepulveda. I, since I, uh, I, I just have uh, two more follow-up questions um, real quick. Um, so I, I think some of the constituents have been um, uh, concerned about safety, and I was hoping that someone could um, speak to that a little bit. Um, and then uh, they also had questions about who who we were housing. Um, uh, I am trying to put this delicately. Um, <laughs> They were uh, there. There were questions about um, the 
uh, the screening process. Um, and so I know privacy, privacy rights. So if uh, you could speak to that a, a little bit, um, that would be helpful. And those are all my questions. Sure. Um, so security, I'm assuming you're talking about at the, the property that has been in the media that's in your district. Um, and I, that, that process is, is ongoing. Um, the, their, the providers and the property owner there are actively working on um, additional security plans. So that's, that's in process and um, more, <clears throat> more security measures um, will begin taking place this week and some of it already has and definitely there will be more um, security presence there starting this weekend. Um, so that, that is in process as well. Um, so that's an answer to that specific property. Um, we, we are housing folks who are homeless in Nashville and that, that really is the answer to that question. There's, there's not a screening process. Um, people aren't screened to, to determine whether they have, they can have housing. The assessment process is based on the vulnerability index, um, with an overlay of what an appropriate housing match could be, um, for that individual or household's situation. Um, so it's not a screening process, so to speak, like you, to be eligible for these funds, you have to be homeless. That's the eligibility criteria. Um, there is, that's it. Um, there is no other. There is no other eligibility question other than being literally homeless. And literally, literally homeless means um, a place not meant for human habitation or an emergency shelter um, or streets, right? Um, so that is the eligibility criteria. So the folks that are that have chosen to go through the assessment process and are eligible for these funds um, are able to be housed. Thank you for that. And 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 thank you for 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 updating us. Um, uh, I know that we we all want to see um, homeless people have permanent housing, and, and so I, I appreciate you all um, taking a lot of this on and um, providing resources and providing uh, uh, updates for us. Um, um, I, I I think we all have the same goal in mind to to permanently house people. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Supervisor. And I want to echo that as well. Uh, so thank you for the good work that you're doing. And uh, we get a lot of emails and stuff. And the fact that we're housing our own house is, uh, is a big task. And so thank you both. I do want to ask, I think in the um, presentation, it said about 368 has been already housed. Uh, how much of that is of that 10 million? Uh, is the 10 million all spent now? We're just putting people in there, or do we still have leftover from the 10 million? We have plans to do some more. So the the 368 is the overall number um, with the all of the all of the funding streams. So with um, the 10 million, 226 people have been housed so far. Um, that we're not done. Uh, <laughs> there will be um, probably between 400 and 450 people housed ultimately uh, with those funds. And right now we're at 226. Um, the way, because of the way rental assistance works, we'll house, we'll house, once we get to where we're, we're our goal or, or the number of people we think we can house with those dollars, the money is still gonna be around because it's gonna pay their rent for a while and, and pay for case managers to be with them for several months, right? So. The money doesn't get MDHA doesn't expend the money all at once because of the way rental assistance works. So that will flow for a while, um, and so agencies have this interesting budget projections they have to do to determine how many people they can serve. Um, but so that goes. Each individual household only has a limit of twelve. Each individual household or individual has a limit of twelve months of rental assistance um, within this program. So for some of those folks that started in October. Uh, some folks, it started in January, you know, so you can kind of understand how it goes from there. Okay. And then uh, I know that uh, Judy talked about the sustainability and keeping it going. And so if after a year people are able to be on their own, then they're good. What if they're not? Do we keep them or how do we make sure we don't turn people back on the street? That's why we were talking about those other voucher opportunities um, and other continuum of care funds like the shelter plus care is some the rapid rehousing the way that it works is for some folks it can it, it can be used as what we call a bridge to another long-term subsidy and they still 
are eligible for that long-term subsidy. Um, so some of the folks, for example, that we have moved in over the last few months, maybe move to a different subsidy, either to stay where they are um, or to move to another unit um, with that particular subsidy. So that will be part of it, um, but we won't wait. Like we won't wait until the end of the 12 months to determine that. Um, that's the other reason for supportive services, right? So the case managers are working with folks along the way to know if they are gonna be able to, to sustain where they are um, or a different housing option, or if they are gonna need longer term subsidies so they can start working on that process sooner rather than later. Well, thank you. I'm looking, oh, I see uh, uh, Councilmember uh, Porterfield, but before I go to you, I see Emil has his hands raised again. Uh, Emil, do you wanna add to that, uh, answer that question as yeah, well? Yeah. You know, just one thing I want to add, one of our roles at MDHA is we monitor all of the grant recipients, and one of the things we check for is to ensure that um, clients have been meeting with case managers at least on a monthly basis to develop a permanent um, housing plan after ESG funds are um, expended. So there is a monitoring component that goes with the funding once we've allocated it. Thank you. Council Member Pothofield. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you for uh, recognizing me, even though I'm not on the committee. Um, I was really interested in hearing about this program, and it, I mean, it sounds like a really um, amazing program. I think that um, there are a lot of concerns around the city um, for the unhoused population, and, you know, a lot, a lot of people are um, just having concerns, and I think um, uh, you all mentioned, you know, the, the best way to address the concerns that people have is to provide housing. So uh, the fact that you all have been able to utilize this CARES money and provide um, not only um, rapid rehousing, but also the wraparound services and providing social workers, I think that that is um, an amazing use of this money. So thank you all so much for um, the work that you all are doing. And, um, you know, I look forward to seeing how council can further support you all in these endeavors. So thank you. Thank you, council member. I'm scrolling to see if there's any um, discussion, council member Taylor and member of the Elton uh, Hospital. Does anyone have any uh, question? Councilman Porterfield is a health and hospital member. Thank you, Councilman Porterfield. Okay. Um, currently right now, I don't, Councilmember Swara. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a long day, and so... Uh, Councilmember Swara, I see Ms. Tackett is right. Ms. Tackett, yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it takes a minute to scroll up and down. <laughs> uh, Ms. Tackett, Ms. Tackett, you recognize. I just want to take this opportunity and thank everybody uh, for their support, but uh, also we're really um, doing a widespread landlord search. Uh, I want to stress this is not, this is um, any landlord. We're looking for any landlord opportunity. And if anybody listens in, please, if, if you want to participate and learn more and how you can participate, please email me at judith.tacket at national.gov. It's really important that uh, I, I want to get that message out. And if you all have any landlords that you, you want to connect us with, please email me. All right. Thank you. Um, I think we're about to wrap up. Ms. Tacket, let me ask you this, and, and Ms. Heather. The, the the place that you have now, is that a permanent place or is it a transit place? Did we, I know that uh, Councilman Ballen was asking about buying hotels and do we have a, a permanent structure or is it just transit place? Just for clarification. Um, I, I, I need to, um, if you can repeat the question, I, I did not quite understand it broken, sorry. Um, I know that Councilmember Allen, one of our questions was suggesting that if there's an hotel or a building or a place that we're buying permanently uh, for these programs, and I know that it was asked once or twice, I know we've done a whole lot. Uh, so I guess my question is, do we have, is that, have we done something like that or do we have plans to do something like that, a more permanent uh, building or structure, whether it's hotel or something?
And I'm guessing my internet is out. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Yes. I just, um, people in this program sign a one year lease. So this is uh, permanent housing. It, it, it is really looking for that sustainability. It can be used as bridge housing if somebody uh, needs some assistance uh, further along. But this is permanent housing and for, for all the efforts that we're putting in. It's really people enter one early like any of us would do when we rent. Okay. Well, thank so, you. Uh, Council yes. Member Swar, I, I, I think your question, it, there is not. The, the simple answer is no. <laughs> There's not a, a set a set building um, right now. Um, what I was talking about with the acquisition and rehab that MDHA has just put out an RFP for, that would be a permanent um, structure that's dedicated to housing folks who are who are currently homeless. So that would be a permanent structure. Um, you don't currently have that okay. in your in your inventory, but that is that is something that hopefully will come from this RFP because it, it adds dedicated units. Thank you. Thank you. It, right. uh, Swar Matt, yes. Yeah. So I, I, I think um, maybe in answering your question, as you may recall, there was a, a $25 million allocated in a capital spending plan, gosh, now two or three years ago, um, that has been dedicated to create what I think is now 80 or 90 units of permanent supportive housing that Metro General Services is building. But the plan is to um, have MDHA take ownership of that building so we can access the federal operating subsidy to provide the operating dollars for that building. Um, so that would be, as I understand it, Ms. Tackett can speak about this in more detail, that that is intended to be permanent supported housing for individuals experiencing homelessness. Thank you. All righty, I'm scrolling through. I don't see anyone, so uh, I'd like to get us out by seven. So thank you all so much for all the work that you do. Thanks for sharing your evening with us. And thank council members for your time too. I know it's been a long day. So uh, if there's no other business, I'd like a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, so we're adjourned. You all have a nice evening. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.